So without further ado here, because we're already started a little bit late, I'm going to uh, I'm going to hand the, the screen over to Tom Seaton, who is our wood bison biologist, and he's the main person with the wood bison project. And I'm going to let him take over from here. I'm going to just share my screen and make sure we can get everything going. And again, thank you. Any questions, anything like that, throw it in the chat and we'll get back to you during the presentation. And if this all works, then I'll be very happy. Okay. Start with that first slide. Okay, we don't want to be there. Okay, you're up, Tom. All right, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, folks. I'm excited to talk to you tonight about interactions between bison and other species. I'd like to start you out with a few observations that I've seen in Alaska and then turn it over to an expert in the field to relate observations from Canada's herds. Let's see here. If I can get the next slide to come up. Okay, there we go. So I'm usually pretty heavy on history of wood bison, but uh, tonight I'm, I'm gonna keep it short. Uh, bison were once native to Alaska, but disappeared over the last few hundred years. Um, as hunting technologies advanced and the rifle became common, habitat and weather was changing and wood bison distribution was drastically reduced. The last rate remaining wood bison survived in a small area of what is now known as Wood Buffalo National Park. And the last known ones were shot in Alaska in about 1915. And this map represents uh, northern bison distribution about 120 years before present. And then conservation minded folks uh, recognized this disaster and many folks led the effort to restore bison over the last uh, 130 years. And we ended up with this northern bison distribution today. And this is made up of uh, relatively small isolated populations of both wood bison and plains bison. Now, if we focus in a little bit more local, this is Alaska and Yukon territory. And this map, on this map, there's about 3000 wood bison in these herds. Um, and there's about 93 years of experience here, starting with the uh, the Delta herd, the Plains bison herd, right in the middle of the map there. Um, in 2015, we added the Lower Anoko herd, which is in the far west of this map. Um, and in my work with bison, a lot of folks have asked about interaction between bison and other species. So um, I thought it was worth this presentation. I'll show you a few pictures of uh, what it's like when um, I see bison in the wild in the Anoko and, and uh, you can think about it a little bit of how, how they interact with their environment. You know, bison, they, they cycle and concentrate nutrients in similar ways to moose and other large herbivores. And the other members of the ecosystem can benefit from that. And I spent a lot of time tracking these bison down and monitoring them. And uh, that includes glorious jobs like picking up feces. And if you look at this image on the right, you can see what a normal fecal pad in a place like the Anoko looks like. That's a sedge meadow that that's sitting in. And on the left, you can see bison. Sometimes when I walk in to get feces, they're, uh, they're kind of moving out of there. I try to get the freshest stuff I can get in. But you can see the vegetation around them is usually really thick and tall. Um, so I, I often walk through quite a distance of this tall, thick vegetation before I get to the places where bison have recently been. Like, uh, like you can see around this fecal pad. And often the vegetation is, is kind of matted down or pushed down or grazed um, right where they're at. And sometimes there's wallows and things there. But one of the things that's really fascinated me is as I'm moving through this kind of thicker, taller vegetation, I really don't see that many passerines or small mammals or frogs and things like that. Part of it's just because I just can't see down through that. But when I get to these places that bison have recently been, I start to see a lot of more passerines and passerines was just songbirds for those who don't know. And uh, you know, I jump frogs around when I'm bending down on my knee trying to pick up bison feces and I'm jumping frogs and I've seen shrews and, and voles and um, uh, a lot of uh, little critters like that. Um, and even though uh, bison are pretty rare on the landscape at this point, it seems that uh, these local small mammals are finding some benefit from the bison presence. And Wes will talk about that a little more. 
And I imagine that this uh, local kind of small mammal benefit uh, that might be happening can work its way up the food chain with more insects uh, around the feces, then you have more small mammals and birds and frogs, and that might lead to small predators and fur bears right up through the ecosystem to big predators and humans and things like that. Um, and those these observations have kind of piqued my interest. Uh, and so I've asked uh, Wes and uh, his wife Joanne to provide this presentation um, to help us with our perspective you know, as Alaskans. Um, so Wes and Joanne, they've literally written the book on bison uh, as it were. Their book on bison society has been extremely insightful for me. Um, and they've got a field guide to Plains bison, which is really useful. Um, and they've just finished a book on bison relationships within the ecosystem, like he's like Wes is going to talk about tonight. And my copy will arrive soon. I haven't got to read it yet. Um, Wes has spent more than 40 years working with bison in almost every habitat they can occupy in Canada. And on topics ranging from ecology to behavior and genetics to subspecies and the design and construction of world-class bison handling facilities. So it's got a really broad experience. Joanne, his wife, is a world-class photographer. And uh, it's you'll see in, in Wes's presentation, she takes pretty amazing photos. Um, and incidentally, they both volunteered uh, to participate in Alaska's wood bison release in the wild in 2015. And they camped out at the soft release pen for a couple of weeks, providing a lot of uh, help and, and some humor too, which was great. So, before Wes got his camera going, we decided to put his picture up. So this is what he looks like. And he'll give a presentation here. Now I'll turn it over to him and then we'll open it up for questions uh, afterward. All right, uh, Wes, it's all yours. Okay, I gotta stop sharing here. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry about the technology, folks. My computer crashed today and I'm having issues with it. So we'll get started. Um, the talk is about the ecological buffalo, and I intentionally used the term buffalo in the title because um, there's a long and very deep cultural association with the term buffalo. Bison is the correct scientific term, but buffalo encapsulates the spirit of the animal, the, the land that they lived on, the cultures that uh, subsisted with the bison. Um, so that's the, the rationale for the term. Uh, as some folks know, the uh, bison are a keystone species. And for those who might not be familiar, the keystone in a stone arch is the top one that's um, supporting the whole structure. If you take that keystone out of the arch, the entire system collapses. So bison are, are essentially, uh, they're, they're the keystone that kept this whole ecosystem right across North America functioning. And they do it in three principal ways. Uh, my slides are messed right up. Um, Well, now I'm all flabbergasted. <laughs> <laughs> Around the outside of this photograph, a series of photographs where the, the names that went, went along with them, uh, so I'll just fake it. Um, this is a bison footprint that's driven deep into the uh, clay. And it's an important function of ecosystem health and ecosystem diversity because it scarifies the seeds that are in the soil that may have lain dormant for perhaps thousands of years. Um, so important, in fact, that a biologist named Sergei Zimov, he's a Russian ecologist, um, has established Pleistocene National Park based solely on uh, the presence of the hoof prints of large hoof mammals on the landscape. Um, I'm just going to try one more thing here. Yeah, there. Did that change for you guys? Can you no. see text with that slide? No, no, just a drawing. Yeah, okay. Um, there. So they do it through the impacts like the, the footprint, they do it through plowing trails through snow. This is in the northern mixed grass prairie, the landscape of southern Canada, um, northern Montana, uh, Dakotas, heavy wind drifting snow that bison punch trails through. Uh, they do it through putting lots of dunk patties on the ground, as Tom mentioned. Uh, this is one that was used uh, by a robin who was sitting up on there searching for its prey, listening for it. Bison wallows will get into in a lot more detail, as will uh, patch grazing, these little swords of grass or sedges that bison graze on. 
And this is a picture of my lovely wife, the photographer for all of the images. And I can't even read my text. My apologies. Um, I think this slide said that Bison affected this system in three different ways. This is the first one, it's called direct impact. And they did it across a, a huge area. Um, this is the original area of the Plains Bison once occupied. Uh, Wood Bison extended all the way from, uh, I live near Edmonton, Alberta, and that's roughly right here in that zone of overlap, all the way up into where you folks are in Alaska. There's two types, as I think as everybody knows, uh, Plains Bison and Wood Bison. And this is a classic uh, Plains Bison. There's several traits that make them distinct from Wood Bison. Uh, the first is the highest point of the hump is centered over the front legs. And that provides a pivot point, a place where these animals can spin uh, in combat between themselves during the rut or to protect themselves from the advances of a pack of wolves, for example. All of the hair coat characteristics on a plain spice and bowl are exaggerated in, in their size and their display. It's much like the breeding pelage of a songbird. All of these characteristics are, are large and exaggerated. Versus a, versus a wood bison, uh, which you guys are most familiar with perhaps. Um, all of the characteristics on the lower half of his body are muted and understated. Um, but the top line is really exaggerated. The highest point of the hump is well forward of the front legs. And that's an adaptation to packing around a head that weighs well, 350, 400 pounds on the end of a meter long neck uh, for cratering through snow all winter long. He does have a large mop of hair on the forehead, but that's about the only really characteristic piece. On a plains bison, they have a sharply demarcated cape line here. And that's an adaptation to hot climates. This hairless area is their thermal window. It's a place for the excess uh, you know, excess body heat, where wood bison doesn't have that. The hair grows smoothly all the way back to the hips. A good apt adaptation to protect itself from biting insects. And they protect themselves from insects through wallowing as well. And this is a scene in Wood Buffalo National Park. They create these earthen areas uh, and every member of the Bison Society will use these to uh, scratch where it itches and try to get rid of the surplus hair in the spring. Um, here's a, a Plains Bison bull wallowing on Northern Great Plains. Um, there's one study that showed fairly conclusively that the Aspen Parkland that stretches across you know, the sort of the center part of Canada um, was pushed back to the north by the horning and rubbing activities of bison on the landscape. Uh, here's one that's got some juniper hung up in his horns. And that pushing back of the Aspen parkland ceased when uh, plains bison were extirpated from North America, well, virtually extirpated. Um, one. Some of the more um, direct impacts that bison have on the landscape uh, are with their bodies, obviously, when wolves or uh, grizzly bears prey upon them, their carcasses are left. And that provides a huge pulse of energy and nutrients into the ecosystem you know, for birds like ravens and countless other bird species. This is a trail camera photograph. This bull was uh, badly gored during the breeding season by another bull. Um, and the folks who were monitoring it had up to 18 different coyotes. And about 20 different bird species came in on, and fed on that carcass. And then some, some of the more subtle relationships that bison have are with the, the species they share space, space and time with. Uh, animals like the snowshoe hare, uh, moose, and caribou, uh, marmots, and the Arctic ground squirrel. Every one of these species is going to be positively impacted by hyphen bison uh, on the landscape. Subtle, subtle little things like this grasshopper, a native to Alaska, and he'll be food for well, virtually every animal on this screen. But grasshoppers and insects in general make up a huge portion of the diet of wolves, for example. In the Yukon, uh, biologist Tom Young found a wood bison that had died during the winter months. And when the hair started to slip off, it, off the carcass in the spring, Five different squirrels came down and, and then took the hair back and, and wove 
their nests entirely out of you know, shed bison here. And if you've got more squirrels on the landscape, then you've got more prey uh, for avian uh, predators and species like pine martens or fishers or mink. This is another footprint example, again from the Northern Great Plains where a, a bison had driven his foot deep into the clay. In the middle of that, um, a horned lark, what an endangered grassland bird had woven her nest entirely out of bison hair that she'd picked up off the landscape and then laid her eggs in it. And then along came a brown-headed cowbird and laid two of her eggs in it. Brown-headed cowbirds evolved with, with plains bison out, right across the Great Plains. Um, and they don't take time to rear their own young because bison were constantly moving and the, and the cowbirds followed them. They're a parasitic nester. And so they, they lay their eggs there for the, the host to rear. And then of course the shed hair. And this is a huge contribution right across the range of plains and wood bison. We'll get into that in a bit more detail. But the entire ecosystem, whether it's the boreal forest, the Aspen Parkland, the Northern Great Plains, it's all driven by bison snot. This is one of my favorite things. As bison are grazing across the landscape, they've got their noses embedded in the vegetation. Um, and every time they take a breath, and they take a big breath, they've got a massive set of lungs. All kinds of bacteria, protozoa, microbes get stuck in the nasal vestibule, get hung up in the mucus that lines that. And periodically, a bison's got to raise his head and, and clean that vestibule out. This is an old bull in the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary in, in the Northwest Territories. And there's a blank slide. As they ingest that food or, and the microbes that they've inhaled, all of that goes down into their rumen. And then eventually it has to work its way through the digestive system and, and out onto the ground. The microbes that they ingest provide up to a quarter of the protein that this animal is going to get on a daily basis. It, it's almost as important as the vegetation that they eat. And all those microbes, protozoa, and bacteria that don't get digested are still viable in the dung. So within this fresh dung pad are thousands, if not millions, of um, microbes. Yeah, darn. This slide, if you could see it, uh, shows uh, that the first species to colonize the dung pad are the microbes, protozoa, and the bacteria. And they in turn are hunted by um, dung beetles, dung flies. And they in turn are hunted by parasitic wasps, parasitic flies. And it's a complete ecosystem functioning within that one dung, dung pad. One of the most important creatures to occupy a dung pad are dung beetles. And this is actually a European importance. Um, a dung beetle called the Photius pimitarius. And these guys have the unique ability to see organic compounds that are drifting up uh, into a sort of a column right above the dung pad. It's much like you and I seeing a smoke column coming up off of a campfire. And these little dung beetles can see that from hundreds of meters away. So they'll fly through an oxygen rich environment, splat headfirst into a nice fresh dung pad and instantly enter an anaerobic environment. That's not healthy for most animals, and they deal with that by very quickly excavating burrow systems throughout the dung pad and bringing oxygen into the, into the dung pad. Um, this is a dung beetle that uh, actually lives in Alaska. It's a little wee tiny thing. Uh, it, it lives on moose uh, pellets, and I suspect that over time, as, as he moves across the landscape with bison on the, on the landscape, that he'll begin to colonize bison patties. On the Northern Great Plains, an example of um, the relationship between dung pads and insects. Um, there's three different functional groups of dung beetles. Uh, th there's the dwellers. They're the ones that like the Photius femitarius, the little red guy. He lands and, and does his whole, reaper, she does, his whole reproductive cycle within that dung pad. The female will create little brood balls inside a chamber, and in each of those brood balls, she'll lay one egg. Another group are the tunnelers. These guys will land on the dung pad, create a little cavity in here, and then tunnel down about 12 to, to 16 inches, and sometimes deeper depending on the soil, um, 
And then there's, there's two types of uh, tunnelers. There's the slow uh, uh, digging tunnelers. They, they take some time to get down there. And the fast tunnelers. They each have different ecologies on how they uh, deposit their brood balls down in that, that burrow system. But this is hugely important for the distribution of nutrients from that dung pat deep into the soil among the root masses of the, of the vegetation. But it also allows moisture infiltration uh, down into that critical area as well. And then there's the classic one that everybody sees, the rollers. Um, these get the ones you see from Africa all the time, standing on their front legs and rolling a dung ball across the landscape. That one little ball has got one egg in it and she'll bury it just beneath the surface or sometimes up in the vegetation where this long milled curlew is about to get a snack. This is a Macau's long spoon, uh, another endangered species, you know, both in Canada and the United States. And so they all benefit by having a diverse uh, dung fauna living within that dung pat. There's uh, a classic uh, wood bison uh, female and a bull in behind. Across the Great Plains, historically, there were upwards of 30 million, with some estimates, 60 million uh, plains bison. Um, and when you think about the number of dung pats that each of these deposited, an average of 10 per day per bison, that's a lot of dung. So I went back through uh, William Hornaday's uh, decline of plains bison graph. This is a graph that he produced showing the crash of plains bison from 1861 to the mid 1880s. And based on the fact that a bison will produce a quarter of her body mass in, in dung insects uh, every year, I extrapolated that, extrapolated that up to the number of insects on the landscape when there were 30 million bison. And this number is in billions, so 300 billion insects during the peak of the bison. And by the time the, the 1880s were around 1890s, there were none left. So you think of all of the insectivores that foraged off of those bugs how what a significant impact that must have had on them. Uh, it must have just been a devastating scene. Now, bison, of course, will graze in sedge meadows like this one. And, and this is the start. It's in the winter months when bison in Alaska or where, when they move into a meadow system, whether it's an upland grassland like this or uh, a wet sedge meadow, they bust through that snowpack with their foreheads uh, cratering down through the snow to get the vegetation. And in the spring, when you're, this, this is a bull, it's, he's got a great foraging crater there. In the spring, you're left with this situation where you've got that tall mat of vegetation, much like Tom's slide, where the side by side of the tall vegetation and, the, and then the uh, photograph where it was grazed heavy. That's what it looks like. And this is the area that greens up first in the spring. It's got the most sunlight, most moisture will, will fall and land on here. And this gets sucked up uh, pretty quick. And this is what it looks like in the spring in a grassland system. And all of bison grazing behavior, whether it's plains bison in, in Alaska or, I mean, uh, wood bison in Alaska or plains bison in Texas, it's this pattern of grazing and, and ungrazed that drove bison ecology right across North America. Because like our lawns, when we're mowing our grass, you cut it, it grows back up quickly, and then you go back out and you cut it again. But every time that grass grows up, it's, it's a type of forest that's instantly digestible and it's got the most nutrition far more so than this taller, ranker stuff. And as soon as the vegetation starts to cure in late summer, early fall, and stops producing this new growth, that's when bison disperse from the rutting herds back out onto the landscape. That's when the big herds of summer fragment into the smaller groups as all of them look for those succulent forages. And this is what it would look like from the air in the Northern Great Plains. You can see the heterogeneity, diversity of the grasslands here that's caused just by bison grazing on that landscape. And bison and moose, of course, they've shared landscapes for as long as wood bison have been around uh, and where plains bison and moose share space. Um, there's been lots of questions asked to me over the years whether moose and bison directly compete for resources, if they're compatible with each other. Uh, so I, I pulled together some information from Elk Island National Park. And this is just east of Edmonton. I actually live right here, this is where I'm coming from. 
Uh, and this is a map that dates back to the 1960s, a guy named William Halsworth, uh, plotted from aerial surveys, the distribution of um, the bison and buffalo in the green, um, moose in the blue, and elk in the red. And you can see that they all share space and time together. They're, they're not exclusive, they're not avoiding each other. And this is the map that shows uh, moose and bison populations over time from 1910 to 1985 when the study stopped. And you can see all of them go up in peaks and, and, and crashes. Almost all of the decline, for bison especially, uh, was human management because Elk Island is a fenced national park. Uh, when the numbers get up into this density, this is the number per hectare, I apologize for the hectare, not acres, um, but you can see the relative scale. Um, management will go in and intervene and bring that back down into the carrying capacity. And over time, as the bison population came down, you can see that there was a massive upburst in, in moose. I wish I had this continued because moose numbers stayed quite high while we kept bison numbers in, in the low to moderate range in that fenced environment. In places like Wood Buffalo National Park and all of the herds that surround it, Moose and bison have coexisted for as long as they've been on the landscape uh, and coexisted quite intimately with each other. Uh, here's a couple of shots from Elk Island. Uh, these guys hung out together for most of the day when I was watching them uh, with virtually no interaction at all. These guys were grazing along the forest edge and willows while the bison grazed the uplands and the edges of the wetland. Um, this is a painting I did that represents how bison will forage through a forested wetland system, uh, and often there would be moose foraging in forests around it. So bison affect vegetation pretty dramatically in some cases. Uh, this is a series of illustrations I did for uh, Grasslands National Park. For those of, of you who are not familiar with it, Grasslands uh, borders the northern edge of Montana in Saskatchewan. It's right on the Canada-US border. And it's a vast open native prairie landscape. As the park was developing, the first uh, ranches that they acquired took place in 1987. And every time they purchased a ranch from a rancher who wanted to retire, they'd take the cattle off and, and leave it vacant to grazers. And over time, it became a truly grass dominated landscape. Lots of different uh, grass species growing there, but there's no forbs and very few flowering plants. So you put bison back on that landscape and they create these grazing lawns. It doesn't matter whether it's a grassland environment like this or a sedge meadow. Eventually, they deplete the root reserves of the grasses and they're replaced with uh, taprooted species. This is a plant called winter fat, uh, called winter fat because cattle actually gain weight on it during the winter months. It's, it's so high in protein. And then if that grazing continues long enough, other species begin to come in and take advantage of those grazing lawns. And this is a, a little wee tiny guy called the Nuttles cottontail or the mountain cottontail. But there's a great diversity in the roots of the plants, far more tap roots that you see here. And that's important uh, in the creation of a really dynamic and diverse ecosystem. You get a whole host of insects and small mammals and birds all thriving within this dynamic community. Uh, shed bison hair, this is one of my favorites. Uh, there's an American biologist who's done a lot of work in Oklahoma on the tall grass prairie, uh, Brian Copridge is his name. And he's shown that uh, nests like this, uh, and this, uh, sorry, I can't see this, but there's a long list of uh, bird species here that have been shown to use bison hair in their nest. This was a chickadee and it, she wove her nest out of bison hair. You can see the black guard hairs and underneath that, there's a dense mat of the under fur um, that provides the warmth. And he's shown that having bison hair in the nest of these passerines increases the chick survival by upwards of 60% because the hair has a strong smell. It hides the smell of the eggs or the chicks from passing noses of predators uh, either avian or, um, or ground, primarily ground. Um, it provides a wonderful uh, insulating layer for warmth. It's the second warmest natural fiber in all of North America. 
next only to the kiviat from the musk oxen. And it has a tremendous ability to shed moisture. So in those spring storms, when the eggs are the uh, chicks, the little hatchlings are really vulnerable, having a, a warm nest uh, aids in their survival. Now, this is a sequence, it's of a Richardson ground squirrel, but it would apply to Arctic ground squirrels or uh, any of the other uh, ground burrowing animals that you might have. And this female ground squirrel lived in a region of the park that hadn't had bison on it for 200 years. Only recently, a very short while before she found this hair, uh, did a bull come over into that part of the park. He wallowed about 20 meters away from her, uh, 200 yards, uh, pardon me, 20 yards, um, thrashed and rolled and left behind a bunch of hair. And she made repeated trips to that wallow. And that's pretty exposed getting all the way over there and back. You can see she's nursing. So she made repeated trips, bringing hair down into her natal nest chamber. Some kind of ancestral memory is functioning in her that she knew the value of this and, and took advantage of it. Uh, bison wallowing, of course, we mentioned earlier, is really important, especially across the, the Great Plains. There's a neat relationship between bison wallows that get flooded in the spring with a host of other species. This landscape is pockmarked with bison wallows. These are all ancient wallows that were last used by bison somewhere in the early 1880s. We reintroduced bison to grasslands in 2006, and they've reactivated a bunch of them and created new ones. So in the spring when these flood, that water lasts for about 10 days. And that's critically important for these species, the spade-footed toad, the boreal chorus frog, and numerous other toads on the Great Plains. This guy, the spade-footed toad, has an incredible metamorphosis. She'll hop over here, lay her eggs in that maybe eight inch deep wallow and her tadpoles will hatch. These tadpoles are born with eyes that face out to the sides, just like every other prey species, they're looking for a threat. But as the water decreases in depth and warms in temperature, they go through a metamorphosis of their skulls um, and the eyes switch from facing sideways to facing forwards. And they switch from grazing on algae and aquatic vegetation to hunting insects and other tadpoles. And eventually they move out of the, out of the wetland in a matter of 10 days or less into a fully morphed adult toad. Really quite a remarkable event. So you think of that extirpation of millions of bison from the landscape and all of these ancient wallows becoming vegetated, the vegetated ones don't hold water. All of that habitat was gone and there would have been billions of these on the landscape. So these populations all crashed along with the bison population. Here in the Aston Parkland, this is in Elk Island National Park, uh, bison will forage on these wetlands just like they do in Alaska throughout the winter months. But then here they'll move up onto these open slopes. Uh, and on, in the Anoko, there's slopes like this, raised areas. And the bison will forage here. Then they'll move back to the forest edge, get into the shade perhaps, lay down, chew their cud, relax, and then they stand up and, and deposit one of these. And this is part of the reason that Tom's been uh, following around picking up bison food. It's, it's really critical stuff. Years ago in Elk Island, I had a, I, I saw this woman crawling around on her knees, hands and knees in a grassy area. And that intrigued me, so I walked over and asked her what she was up to. And she turned out to be a, a researcher from Finland that had come to Elk Island to study the slave-making behavior of one ant species on another. And to do that, she was following individual ants as they left their home colony. And they'd tra traipse across the grass, invade a, a different species nest, snag a, a worker ant and bring it back and turn it into a slave. In doing that, she discovered that virtually every ant hill in the park uh, is established on a bison paddy, virtually without exception. And because there's more patties adjacent to the forest edge than there is out in, in the meadow system to the forage, um, that's important for this guy, the northern flicker. These guys are, uh, in this ecosystem, uh, the bulk of their diet is ants. So they live along the forest edge. They'll hop out on the grass and hunt ants, bring it back and feed their chicks in a cavity that they've excavated in a tree. And it turns out the size of that cavity, the diameter of it, 
is perfect for the northern flying squirrel. Um, smaller woodpeckers are too small, bigger ones are, are too big, um, but the flicker is the Goldilocks of cavities for the flying squirrel. And these guys are fussy in the cavities that they use. They have cavities that they use just for their refugia. It's a place to escape to a, a secure cavity that they, they feel protected in. They have another one that they use just as their natal den, a place where they can go and rear their young. And then they have another one that they use just for their toilet. So they'll go in here and sometimes these cavities can be 36, 40 inches deep. Uh, and they fill that up eventually with their, with their dung. And living in that is this guy. It's a little wee tiny guy. He's not much more than an eighth of an inch in length, um, a photius maticeps. And the only place you'll find him is on flying squirrel dung. So without having bison on the landscape and the dung that they deposit and the ants that colonize the dung and the woodpeckers that eat the ants all through that, that sequence of events, this tiny little be charismatic mini fauna wouldn't exist. So that kind of wraps me up. And again, my apologies for um, the poor quality slides. My computer crashed earlier today and I was scrambling to get it fixed and didn't in time. 